to have you with us this morning. If you're a regular attender here, there are uh, connection cards probably in front of you or behind you, or you can go to ankenyconnect.org if there's prayer requests that you have or if there's anything that you want to update or service opportunities. We'd love to be with you and, uh, and help you get connected to wherever you need to be at. If you have any of that stuff or you have a gift or offering, um, instead of passing the plate, what we have is some boxes there in the back that you could do that. Or if you're online, you can give at ankenygive.org. We also have coming up here at the beginning of November our special harvest offering here in November 8th. We give a harvest offering every year. It's a special offering that we do. And your generosity in previous harvest offerings has helped us to transform the student center into a worship area that's now a beautiful gym, complete with basketball hoops, a pickleball court, and an Awana game space. We've also seen the area between our two buildings become a gathering space for connection and encouragement with picnic tables, pergolas, and even, not today, but in previous weeks, an outdoor worship venue. Thank you, Snow. Each week, the newly named courtyard provides a destination for our church family to build relationships through conversations before and after the worship services and an area for community groups to grow deeper in God's Word and have an outdoor space for our youth to play games and to connect in small groups. This year, what we'd like to do is we'd like to continue our commitment to becoming an even more welcoming church by remodeling the lobby and office area of the Student Center building. Reconfiguring the offices in the foyer will create a more open and accessible main office for our people, as well as improve our office layout and function for current and future staff. Remodeling the lobby will also communicate to parents uh, the commitment and care we have for their children and our desire to see them fully engaged and actively pursue a growing relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We would also like to see a portion of our harvest offering go to bless a local partner who's being used by God to further the gospel. This year, we would like to bless Living Water Evangelical Free Church. It's led by Pastor uh, Walanja, or Pastor Willie as he goes by. He's a refugee from Congo who moved into this building rather recently, even though he's been in the Iowa area for quite some time. And he's committed to reaching African immigrants um, here in Des Moines. This is an amazing opportunity. Living Water is getting it done when it comes to the gospel and outreach. Um, They just have a new building that they're moving into, and what an opportunity for us to come alongside. Um, I don't know how many of us in this room, maybe a few of us, could go to the Democratic Republic of Congo and be able to spread the gospel, but not many. It's a war-torn land and it's, it's ravaged by all sorts of uh, particular infighting. And yet, here we can raise up leaders to send the gospel back to that area and surrounding areas in order to have impact, not only locally, but globally as well. So we're excited to be a part of that. So that'll be coming up. We wanted to let you know. All right. We are in the book of John. So grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're in the middle of a series here where we look at the life of Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 6 says, if we abide in him, then we will walk as Jesus walked. So Jesus then not only becomes our savior, but also a model for what the Christian life is to be about. It seems obvious, but I found oftentimes we miss that. And certainly if he's a model for anything, he's a model for what it means to make disciples. And we look at the challenges of Jesus Christ, that he challenges people to come and see in order that we might believe. And then those that believe he challenges to follow me, where we take on his character and his priorities. And then those that say, follow me, he challenges to become fishers of people and then to have this life of bearing fruit in that. And we're going to look at what it means to follow me. To, I mean, not to follow me, to come and uh, to fish for people. And that's what John chapter 17 has been about. Jesus is here praying for his disciples. And we're going to look at just one verse, verse 18. And it's going to be talking about being sent 
into this world. What is your mission in life? You know, I think for many people, their mission in life is to have just a little bit more happiness. Want to take your life and have just a little bit more happiness. Just make it a little bit better. Maybe it's, I, I want to do a little bit better in school or have a, a few more friends. Or, or I, I just, I want to improve my relationships and have a little less drama and a little less conflict. Maybe it comes to your living situation or the things that you drive or other things that you own. I just want a little bit better. Maybe you think about your job. I, I kind of like it. I don't know. If, if it was just a little bit better. Maybe your health. If your health was just a little bit better, then we would be doing just fine. Always just this little bit better. And for those of you that have ever been in a spot where things have gotten a little bit better, you find out your mission then becomes what? Well, maybe I just needed a little bit better than that. So as Christians, we've been here, we talk about the life of Jesus. We are to live as sent individuals. There's two ways we can think about this idea of living just a little bit better. One, we say, you know what? We're not here to live just a little bit better. We're here to live to the glory of God and to do his mission. And amen, that is exactly true. But there's another way to think about this as well. Because that way says we, we shouldn't be living a little bit better. We need to think altogether different about it. This other way says, you know what? I'm maybe not thinking about my happiness enough. I need to think about it. I don't need just a little bit better life. I need a lot better life. I, I don't want just a, a, a little bit better house. I need a house with, with 20 bays, all filled with amazing cars. I don't want it just to have an upgrade in siding. I want gold with diamond windows, and I want a titanium staircase. And, and I don't want to just go on a little bit better vacations. I want to see the, the secrets of this world. I want to enjoy everything that there is with, with incredible feasts before me. And in fact, I want a happiness so great that things can't even satisfy it. So I, I want to know maybe who the people are behind, the, the designers behind these amazing houses, these people that would be um, there that are, that are crafters of society, maybe even behind that, who made this world and all that there is in it. There, there's a happiness that I want that can't be found just simply in stuff. I want to know the one who's there behind it, uh, the one who is smarter than anyone, more beautiful than anything, the, the one who, who knows the end from the beginning this one that has all power and all control, that's the one that I want to know. And, and not only do I want to know that person, to sit in their glory, they, if I want to maximize my happiness, I need to change. And, and not just through a little bit of self-effort. I, I can't do that. I, I need to be transformed. And, I've got tremendous issues and fallenness and brokenness. I need to be changed so I can enjoy this one forever and ever. I need to be transformed because my life has a short lifespan. This, this body that I have only lasts a particular time. I need a body that, that can endure if I'm to maximize my happiness. If I want to maximize my happiness, I need to be able to know love from this one and to truly love this one as well. And in fact, if I want to maximize my head, that, that sort of love needs to spill out over toward other people because if this one is truly that great, this one has a capacity beyond just simply loving you or just simply loving me. And there's a joy that that comes from telling others and introducing others to this one. So there's this, another way to think about living sent that sometimes 
we confine ourselves to simply thinking, you know, I want a little bit more. You're, you're not thinking about your happiness and your joy nearly enough. Uh, imagine if you will, are, are you guys, anyone here familiar with the game of basketball? Anybody familiar with the game of basketball? Yeah, there's like this whole subculture, and these people watch it, and there's like paid people. They get paid to play it, and they do these tournaments, and they have this whole season, and in the end, well, at any rate, um, they just had one of these in the NBA championships, and a team from Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Lakers, just won the NBA championships. If you're not familiar with this, I'll talk to you later. It's a whole deal. But some of you know a little bit about this game called basketball, right? Well, at any rate, some of these people that play really become pretty popular. So one of the popular players is named LeBron James. Now imagine just off of this championship, and you're all into basketball, and you know like some of the teams and the rules about the dribbling and all this, and you're like into it, and you have friends that are into it, and you're like, hey, you know, LeBron James gives you a call, and he says, hey, I'm LeBron James, I'm going to be in Des Moines, and what I'd love to do is hang out at your house, we could have like a lunch in there, we could, you know, smoked meats or, or whatever, we'll just have a big get-together, and I'd just love to hang out with you and your friends. What would you do? Well, I, I think you'd be motivated to have friends come over because it's like LeBron James and we can like hang out at my house and we could just be there and it'd be great. And you'd want people there too, not just for your sake, but you know, if LeBron came over and it's just you and you know, maybe one of your kids because your spouse is out running errands or something, that seemed kind of lame. LeBron James is like, oh, you know, I'm cool. I just love to hang out with you, but really, this is it? You know, this is kind of what you're doing. You know, it's, there, there's no, there's an excitement. You'd be like, people, if you want to see LeBron James, now's the time to see LeBron James over at my house. Well, how much more is it that we as believers are to live sent on a mission to glorify the Lord not only for his sake, but also for the joy of all people that they would know him and believe in him. We are to live as sent people. John 17. The book of John is divided up into three parts. Chapters 1 through 11 talk about the seven miracles of Jesus. Chapters 12 through 17, they talk about the last week of Jesus' life where he instructs his disciples. And then chapter 18 to the end talks about Jesus' trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and appearance to the disciples. And so here in chapter 17, we have the longest recorded prayer of Jesus anywhere. And we find here in the midst of this, he's praying, praying for his disciples and even praying for us. And I'm going to read just one verse, verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Let us pray. Father, I would ask that today you speak to our hearts There are so many obstacles and issues that cloud and prevent us from doing that which you've called us to. And so, Lord, I pray that today it would be your words that change and transform us. As my muddy fingers come and somewhat smudge your text. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would hear truly what it is you have to say to us. Work through me or in spite of me. But Lord, honor your name this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today what we're going to do is I want to reinforce this point that Jesus sends us. This is not some small part of what Jesus told his disciples. This is a key aspect that they would follow him. I want to give a personal example, and then we're going to look at 
four priorities that we need to have when it comes to living as sent individuals. So here we go. Jesus sent his disciples. It, it's right there in the text. As you sent me into the world, Jesus talking to the Father, so I have sent them into the world. This is not a new idea that Jesus sends those who follow him. Um, let us look at a couple of passages just to reinforce this point. Uh, let's first look at John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And let's start in verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then jump down to verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So here we see Jesus sending people, both by prepping them that there will be messengers that sent that represent the master, but also that he is actually sending those as well. Not only does Jesus send people, but he sends them with help, or more specifically, a helper. Chapter 14, verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And again, here in verse 26 of chapter 14, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus here in chapter 15 expects that we will indeed be fruit bearing. And he concludes here in this passage with verse 26 and 27. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So we see that there is this expectation that those who are following Jesus would be sent in the way that Jesus was sent. We see this even finally, John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus now has risen again and is appearing to his disciples. And in verse 21, he says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus sending his followers into the world as he went into the world, is throughout the pages of the New Testament. And it should be something that imprints on our hearts, that as followers of Jesus, he is sending us out, even as he was sent out, with the message of the good news of Jesus, that we are to bear witness to the Father, to a world that desperately needs him. Congrats, you guys are all missionaries. And that's what it's supposed to be. If you trust in Jesus, this is your job. And I think we miss this sometimes in church. I, I, I was particularly blessed in this way, I, I will say. So let me tell you a little story about, uh, about what the Lord did in my life. I grew up, went to a great church, great family, but I did not, I, I maybe heard the gospel, but it didn't, didn't settle in my heart. I, I believed that if you were just good enough or better than the person sitting next to you, that you would go to heaven. That's kind of what it took, just being better than people around you. And that was kind of difficult, actually, for two reasons. One, it's incredibly arrogant. And two, it wasn't really even true. I was horrible. So there I was, uh, believing this lie and, and not even living faithfully to it. I went to college and before classes start, that Sunday before, my freshman year, a friend invited me to church. And I've been going to church. I was looking for a church, and we went. It was great. Actually, he needed a ride to that church and said, Can I, do you have a car, is actually what he asked. And I said, yes. And he's like, well, hey, do you have a church? No, I don't. He goes, well, why don't you come with me if you're dropping me off? At any rate, that's a, that's a story in and of itself. But it, So I go there, and it's great, and they're starting up this campus group. So I go to the first meeting on Wednesday night. There's like six other students, not very many people in the room. But I'm sitting there, 
And Kenny Young preaches on genuine Christianity. And before he starts talking about what that is, he talks about what that isn't. And when he describes what it isn't, he describes my life. He shares how it's not about just being better than someone else, how it's not trying to do a bunch of good things to earn God's love. That's not what it is. And I'm sure he said other things, but I was struck. And I get done with that time, and one of the staff members comes over, and he's like, well, you know, hey, how you doing? What would you think of the message? And I was like, what do I think? I mean, you just described me. I, 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 think, I think I'm going to hell. I don't, I think this is not, I, I've lived a lie. And he took me aside. And he shared with me Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not because of works, so that no one can boast. And because I grew up in a great church that loved Jesus and had great parents, I knew all about Jesus, but suddenly now Jesus had a place, and my eyes were opened. And there on the top steps of Defoe Hall, I trusted the Lord Jesus. God's grace came to me. That was Wednesday. Saturday, me and this guy, we went door to door doing spiritual interest surveys to tell other people about Jesus. Now this was, it was a great church. It was normal. It wasn't a cult. We was just, it was just an expectation. You would share about Jesus with others. So there I was. And I'm, if you know me, I'm not a door-to-door sort of guy. It's just not, it's not my personality. That's what we did almost every Saturday. We went door-to-door. And we saw, in some ways, very little fruit. <laughs> we did not witness a whole lot of things happening during those times. Some good conversations, yes, but, but not a whole lot else. But there's one thing that it did do is it imprinted on my heart this expectation that if I'm going to follow Jesus, I live as a, as a sent one, as a messenger, as someone that is there to, to bear the, the bright light of the good news of Jesus to a world that desperately needs it. That's what I'm here to do. And that's what we're here to do. And I pray today that this would be one of those times where we're reminded once again that if you're a follower of Christ, the expectation is is that you would live as someone who is sent. So, what does that mean for us? Well, there's four priorities. There's four priorities that we see in the book of John, actually. Four priorities that we see in the book of John. Uh, The first is this, is that it is a message. We are sent with a message. There is a message that we are sent with. Uh, The Bible talks a lot about doing good things, and we are to do good things. There is to be transformation in our lives. We are to show genuine love and care for other people. We're to, to come alongside in desperate situations. All of this is true. There is transformation in our behavior. There are things that the Spirit works out in us that others are to see. But yet, first and foremost... Um, We are not simply those that wander around doing random acts of kindness. We bear a message because we live in a world that that looks to other things to rescue them. They look to the idea of, I just need a little bit better whatever, and that's going to be enough. Throughout time and history, we've seen that people have placed their, their hope in in governments, that they will bring about the peace and the good life that I so desperately desire. Or, or they look to their ancestors that have gone and passed on, that they will somehow bless my life now, or that somehow the universe will simply reward the good things that I am doing and kind of, you know, what comes around goes around. And, and this is just not true. We're flawed, we're broken. 
But the universe is not impersonal matter with atoms colliding around. We're not simply a, a, a composition of, uh, of carbon and oxygen, some nitrogen and other things that uh, produces biochemical reactions which we interpret as love or decisions. We are, you know, in this view, we would not be much different than a rock, except we can move around, at least for a little while. No, there's something else that's true, something deeper than that, and that is this, is that there is a God who created this universe. And even though we rebelled against him in his great love, he rescues us by God the Father sending God the Son in order that, that we might know him and that we might be changed and transformed in order to dwell with him forever. And while we are here living in the already not yet time, he gives us God the Spirit to be with us, to empower us not only for our joy, but for the mission that He has for us. And we come bearing this message of, of good news to a world that so desperately needs it. I, I don't know what you're hearing on the TV, but we need something different. There's a message that can be trusted, that brings actual hope and change and has power to transform. And that's what we do. And so we need to realize that when we're sent, we're sent with a message. That we're meant to bear witness to Jesus Christ. That, that we are to, as it says here in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 3. We come with a message. A, a second priority when we think about living sin is not just the message, but also the helper, the helper. Here, here we've seen several passages as we lead up to this. Let me revisit some of those. John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. This is advocate or counselor. It's referring to God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we will have Verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. We see it again in verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, we see it at the end of John 15, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the very beginning. In fact, even if we were to go on to John chapter 20, where Jesus sends them out as the Father sent them out, immediately there is a call to receive the Spirit. And so I don't want to get too mystical here. But the work that we are being asked to do, we cannot do. We, it's, it's heart change. It's transformation. This has to be the work of the Lord. And so nowhere do we see quite this emphasis on the sovereignty of God as we do in the book of John. And here yet Jesus is also sending us. I'd like to point you to this, this great book. It's, it's not very long, <laughs> for those of you that were worried about that. Uh, it's J.I. Packer. I love J.I. Packer. would read anything by J.I. Packer. It's called Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God on, on how we need to understand God's sovereignty and our own responsibility. We don't need to um, abandon those as we think about this task that the Lord has before us. But we need to realize that this is not an effort of the flesh. So we need to pray and watch with our eyes open as to what the Lord may have for us in this particular day, where the Spirit is leading us, 
or we're being fed by God's Word in order to see what God has for the world and even for our very lives. We need to to walk in this world with these kinds of eyes open, dependent upon what the Spirit would have for us. I mean, we can… words are examples, but what really penetrates to the heart has to be the work of God. And so, we need God to lead us and to show us what it is that we are to do. This has to be a work of the Spirit, and we have to be dependent upon the Spirit in order to do what God has sent us to do. The helper, the helper. Now, we see the message, the helper, but the cost. The cost. Jesus says in John 16, 33, before he begins to pray for his disciples, he says this, I have said these things in you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation or trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If you want to follow Jesus, it'll cost you. It'll cost you. Some Some of it may just be rather obvious. It takes up your time. You put effort towards it. It'll cost you money. Doing things that Jesus has asked you to do, it'll cost you. There is a a cost there. But, But it costs you even more. Your identity is bound up in Him and in Him alone. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says in Galatians 2.20. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That there's been an exchange here. That our life is no longer our own. We belong to God. And with that comes a cost. With that comes a cost. Rosaria Butterfield is a popular Christian author and great critical thinker on culture and society and even biblical issues, particularly things like hospitality. But when she came to Christ, it cost her. It cost her nearly everything. She was a lesbian in a committed relationship. She was the head of her department at Syracuse in women's studies. She had a a great and loving community of friends that surrounded her. She even had a dog that she dearly loved. But in that time, she was seeing what some Christians were doing, and she wanted to investigate it deeply. And being a researcher, she went to the original sources and began reading and studying the Bible to more deeply understand what some of these Christians were doing. And in that, she sought out a guide, someone to be able to help her in this, just an ordinary small church Presbyterian pastor, no particular note. But the Spirit of God began working in her, and she went from her unbelief to belief. She went from just simply making her life a little bit better to seeing this, that this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And she put her trust in Jesus. The Lord opened her eyes. This unlikeliest, or even as her uh, her book says, uh, the secret thoughts of an unlikely convert. But in that time, she lost everything. She lost her partner, With integrity, she couldn't teach things that she no longer believed, so she lost her job, tenured professorship. The loving community that surrounded her, I mean, still very loving, still very kind, but she knew she had to be with people in church, you know, with people that love the Lord. So she lost, she went from a pretty friendly environment to people knew who she was, the reception, honestly, at the beginning wasn't all that warm. She even lost her dog in the midst of this. But she would say it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. 
And you know, and I could share more stories, that even though it costs, it's worth it to follow the Lord. It's worth everything because He is more. He is more. It costs. And then finally, it's important. It's important. In John chapter 6, Jesus preaches a pretty tough message that not only do people need to trust in Him, they need to be united with Him. He uses some pretty vivid and, quite frankly, offensive imagery of eating my flesh and drinking my blood. You must be united with me. The, the sort of thing that Jesus is equating Himself with is, is rather stark to a, a polite Jewish crowd. And those that once followed Him, it says here in verse 66, He says, after this, Many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's important. Where else are we going to go? Or if you truly want to be a, a light and a help in this world, where else are you going to point people to? Where else are we going to find the words of life? The news? The, the latest great idea to come from whatever government, the strength of our scientific arm, our discoveries, our ingenuity, our capacity for, for helpful, heart-wrenching stories, while good, they all fail. You know, in this world, we see there are words, <laughs> there are words of confusion, but Jesus brings words of clarity. There, there are words of despair, but Jesus gives us words of hope. We wonder, you know, where in this world can I find words that aren't just flat out lies? Well, it's Jesus that gives us words of truth. Oh, the words we often hear are words where people have an agenda, and yet Jesus gives us words where He's self-giving. In this world, we find words of death. Jesus gives us words of eternal life. We need to live sent as men and women on mission, bearing a message by the power of the Holy Spirit. And even though it costs, there is no work that is more important. I like to think about how we wound up here today. We are here because when Christ ascended to heaven, faithful women and men lived sent. They shared the message of Jesus with other people. They shared him with other people. And they formed churches, and those churches sprouted other churches. And they spread across nations, across continents, across cultures, across oceans. They transcended all the kinds of barriers and demographics that we can come up with. And the gospel endured over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, and over the millennia. And someone told someone who told someone who told you. And here we rest at the end 
of a long chain of, of chain builders. And it's up to us that if the Lord tarries, <laughs> waiting one more time, we, we are to not be the last link in that chain. We are to live as sent men and women like the believers that have gone before us. As the worship team comes forward, I'd like to conclude with a, a brief encouragement here. Again, compelled by love here, J.I. Packer is just great as he talks about our responsibility to live as sent individuals. He says this, May I stress again, if we ourselves have known anything of the love of Christ for us, if our hearts have felt any measure of gratitude for the grace that has saved us from death and hell, then this attitude of compassion and care for our spiritually needy fellow men ought to come naturally and spontaneously to us. We are loved people. And we love because he first loved us. So live sent. Let us pray. Oh, Father, I pray that there would be a movement of your spirit among us here this morning. That we would not be content with just a little bit better. But we would want that which is best, which is you. And to share you with other people. pray, O oh Lord, you'd give us a vision for what that means in our life. That we would be a bright light in this community. I, I pray for those that are needy and that are hurting. Those that are sick and afraid. Those who are wondering where their next meal will come from. Or, or how they're going to stay warm in the cold weather. Lord, I pray for those that are living with hidden pain, there's distress and, and hurt because of relationships, those living with betrayal and confusion, those who are trapped in maybe chains of their own making. Lord, be gracious, rescue and free them. And I pray for us as a church then in these times we would be united to be about your mission, to, to love you and to love others. See men and women come to know you and grow in you all to your glory. Because our hope in this world is this, is that whether in life or death, we belong to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.